Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Lewis and Clark Interpreter Center. My name is Jeff LaRock, and I'm the supervisory interpreter here. And today I want to talk to you about uh, one of the more major milestones in the Lewis and Clark expedition, the portages of the Great Falls. Notice I just used a plural. If you've been exposed to the story of the Lewis and Clark expedition, you probably know about the portage around the Great Falls in the summer of 1805. It is rightly remembered as one of the great obstacles the expedition has to overcome on its way to the Pacific. But what goes out must come back. There is a second portage in 1806 that very few people know much about, partly because it was accomplished with a lot less trouble. And the main reason for that is the difference between planning for what you expect and planning for what's really there. When the Lewis and Clark expedition headed up the Missouri River in the spring of 1804, they were carrying a lot of baggage. And I am not talking about the 30 tons of cargo in their boats. They had a lot of preconceived notions of what they would find when they came to the West. Mainly the expectation that the West would be a mirror image of the East. Uh, that the Missouri River, like the Ohio, would run in a relatively straight line between the mountains and the Mississippi. They assumed also that the Rocky Mountains would resemble the Appalachians, with easily accessible low elevation passes running through them. Yet they also believed that in the West would be a pyramidal height of land, a common origin area from which all the big rivers of the West issued forth. That meant that if you could get to the headwaters of the Missouri River, it should be a relatively easy trek over the Continental Divide to head, find the headwaters of the Columbia or some other convenient west flowing river that like the coastal rivers back east would flow in a fairly straight line down to the Pacific. Well, none of that is true. <clears throat> and a summer spent traveling up the, Missis uh, up the Missouri and a winter spent speaking with the Mandan and Hidatsa should have told them this. But the expedition set out in the spring of 1805, assuming that they would reach the Pacific coast and return to North Dakota by the end of the year. For a while, they were doing all right. They were making decent progress. They were spotting the smaller creeks coming into the Missouri the natives had told them about. And then early in June, they reached the mouth of the Marias River and everything came to a screeching halt. Because here was a, a raw water course they hadn't heard about, or at least they didn't think they had. Remember that Lewis and Clark almost never spoke directly with the native peoples they met along the way. The conversation usually went through an interpreter, sometimes a chain of interpreters who had violent disagreements about the meaning of words. It's quite possible that the Hidatsa, who did most of the traveling around this part of the world, were telling Lewis and Clark all about the Great Falls and they lost it in translation. It's equally possible that the Hidatsa didn't know as much about the Marias. I mean, you're traveling into northern Montana Indian style on horseback and packing light. You will stay close to the Missouri River for as long as you can get away with it because it's a reliable water source. But eventually you'll be peeling off to come to go and do what you came to do, whether that's hunt bison or raid your enemies or whatever. So it is quite possible the Hidatsa just didn't know that much about the Marias River. But they had told Lewis one very important fact that on the Missouri River near the Rocky Mountains there was a great waterfall. And so Lewis has been looking for signs of that. But here, Lewis has come to a place where it looks like the Missouri River has torn itself in half. Uh, in this spring of the year, the Marias River looks pretty much like the Missouri. It's got a lot of water flowing through it. And that northern branch, which we know is the Marias River, looks just like the Missouri with a heavy load of silt. The southern branch, the main route of the Missouri, is much clearer. Because of this, most of the men on the expedition think that the northern branch might be the true course of the Missouri, while Lewis and Clark believe the southern branch might be it simply because it looks to them like a river coming out of the mountains that they can see in the distance. They send parties up both streams for a day and a half trying to find some obvious sign of which is the correct way, but without any particular success. Lewis, who went up the Marias, comes back convinced that the southern branch is the correct way and announces to the men that he will take an advance party forward on that branch for five days, with the main party following three days behind. If he's wrong, they won't be badly out of position, and if he's right, they won't be wasting any more time. Well, on the third morning out, Lewis's party pulls back from the edge of the river to an area of high ground where Lewis can get a nice panoramic view of the landscape. Uh, 
Then uh, they head back towards the river because it's getting hot. As they approach, Lewis sees what we saw in the distance with, to, to be a uh, cloud of smoke, which causes them to increase their pace. The expedition hasn't seen an Indian since they left Fort Mandan. They're hoping this might be a signal fire. But closer still, Lewis said this was clear that this was now a cloud of spray. He said, closer still, we heard, uh, I said, our ears were greeted by the agreeable sound of a fall of water. He said, as we got closer, the roaring became too tremendous to be mistaken for any source apart from the Great Falls of the Missouri. So early in the afternoon on June 13th, 1805, Meriwether Lewis and his men are the first white men we know of to see the Great Falls. Lewis was positively entranced. He sat at the base of the falls for hours looking up at it, uh, lamenting in his journal that he lacked the artistic or poetic ability to convey its total grandeur. But Lewis also notes the problem. The Great Falls is 97 feet high and it's in a 200 foot deep canyon. The only, way you're, the only reason to send a boat over it is to destroy the boat. You're going to have to portage around it. But it's getting late in the day, so Lewis's party camp for the night. The next day, Lewis sends one man back to let Clark and the others know this is the right way, come on. He sends the other men out to hunt because they're gonna need supplies while he tries to scout out a way to get around this great waterfall. Over the course of the 14th of June, probably one of the strangest days in Lewis's life, he finds that above the Great Falls is not more river, but four additional waterfalls and several major rapids and eventually the mouth of the Sun River. This is gonna be a lot more difficult than he thinks. But by the time Lewis reached the Sun River, it's late afternoon and he thinks he's gonna be spending the night apart from his men. He shoots a bison to get something to eat, gets caught up in harvesting the meat and uh, forgets to reload his rifle or to notice grizzly bear coming up behind him. <clears throat> Lewis notices the bear at a distance of 30 yards and realizes first that his rifle is empty and second that the nearest tree is over 300 yards away. Lewis very slowly picks up his rifle and tries to back away at which point, he says, the bear rears up, roars at him, and comes at him. Lewis runs for his life, jumps into the river, wades out up to his waist, turns and prepares to defend himself with the one weapon he's carrying that still works, his espontoon, this eight-foot-long boar spear that he carries as a mark of office and kind of a walking stick. But the bear has what it wants. Lewis is away from that big, juicy bison carcass, so it leaves. Lewis very gratefully crawls out of the river, reloads his rifle and goes on his way, only to have other encounters that convince him, as he wrote, that the, the beasts of this neighborhood are in league to destroy me. And so goes all the way back to the camp at the Great Falls, arriving past midnight and spending most of June 15th calming his nerves by fishing. Clark came up with the main party a couple of days later and the real work got started. It would, fall to Lewis, uh, it would fall to William Clark to map the portage route. That's his primary job on the trip. He is the expedition's main map maker. He's supposed to try and find the shortest, flattest, most easily traveled path to get around all of these obstacles that nature has placed on the river. Well, short, flat, and easily traveled are not adjectives normally assigned to this part of Montana. And in the end, uh, the tolerably flat route that Clark picks out stretches 18 and a quarter miles from the mouth of Belt Creek all the way to the White Bear Islands, uh, coming across this major bend in the river. That's twice the length of the longest portage used in the commercial fur trade. And unlike the voyageurs, Lewis and Clark's men aren't in 400 pound birch bark trade canoes. They're in dugouts like this one hollowed out cottonwood logs that weigh over a ton dry and more when they've been in the water for several months. There is no way for the men to carry these things 18 miles on their shoulders, so they have to find an alternative. Now, the expedition had two slightly larger boats with them, the red and white pirogues, and there's no way at all they're going to be portaged, so they've been cached. The red pirogue at the mouth of the Marias River and the white pirogue at the start of the portage. The masts from the portage get salvaged and made into the frame for a pair of rather crude carts with cottonwood rounds for wheels and axles. 
The men haul the carts up the hill above the camp, drag the canoes into position, load the canoes into the carts, load goods into the canoes, harness up the men with rawhide ropes, and pull for all they're worth. Across 18 and a quarter miles each way for four round trips. Now, the Hidatsa had informed Meriwether Lewis that he might pass the Great Falls in a portage of two days. And had the expedition been traveling light and on horseback like most native parties would, that was probably true. But with all of the gear that had to be shifted all the, across those 18 miles, the portage for Lewis and Clark encompassed two grueling weeks of backbreaking labor. We hear about the situation from the men in their journals. For starters, all the journalists admit that the mosquitoes around here are more troublesome than usual, which is saying something on this trip. <laughs> Great Falls in 1805 is an open rolling plain. Relatively few trees, lots of bison. The men aren't going hungry. But it rains almost every day, and in between the rainstorms you have strong winds. Dries things quickly, but leaves the ground very rough when you're walking around in moccasins. On top of that, where the bison have grazed heavily, you have a lot of cactus coming back in. It's still common out there today. But of course, if you're walking across the landscape nowadays and you see a patch of prickly pear in front of you, you can go around it. When you're harnessed up like a dray horse, pulling with all your might, you're necess not necessarily putting a good idea in where your feet are landing. William Clark reports pulling 18 cactus spines out of the soles of his moccasins in a single day. And speaks about the other problems the men have. <clears throat> uh, he speaks of men grasping at folds in the earth, protruding stones, shrubs, anything for some extra leverage to move these massive loads across the landscape. The axles and, uh, on these uh, carts are made of cottonwood, very soft wood. They break regularly. Clark also speaks of the men not involved in the repair of the axles lying down and being asleep as their head hits the uh, earth from their fatigues. It's fairly cool most of the time the expedition is here, but uh, about the 28th of June, you have a broiling hot day the men, and heavy rain. The men are forced to leave half of their cargo halfway across the uh, portage to get everything in at night. The next day dawns even hotter, so the men go out to recover their pieces and get caught in a massive thunderstorm where they're dealing with rain falling horizontally and hail that Lewis describes as the size of pigeon's eggs. Today we would call that golf ball sized hail. And this sort of thing goes on for two weeks. Now we don't hear much about the portage from Meriwether Lewis because he only goes across the portage once, stays at the far end because he has other things that has to be done. Uh, with the expedition now missing the red and white pirogues, they are several tons of cargo capacity shy of what they will need to continue. But as with many things, Meriwether Lewis has a plan for this situation. Way back in the spring of 1803, Lewis is gathering equipment for his expedition at the Harpers Ferry Arsenal in Virginia. While he was there, he had the armorers build him a portable boat frame. There's a copy of it out in front of our building. It's the iron skeleton of a 40-foot long leather-hulled canoe. Uh, Lewis tested his design in the Potomac River. It worked fine there, so he took everything down, loaded up the metal in a crate, took it in along with them. It rides across the first portage, and Lewis begins assembling it at the far end with help from Patrick Gass, the expedition's best carpenter, and Georges Druyer, the party's best hunter. You see, you build the frame, you have to reinforce it, you lay down planking on the floor, floor to make a solid bottom, and then you make the hull by stretching rawhide leather over the frame and bolting it in place. <clears throat> Lewis wants elk skin. He can't get enough, so he winds up using buffalo hides for part of this, but he does also have to waterproof it. Back at Harper's Ferry, Lewis had access to pitch, and it worked fine, but he didn't bring any pitch along. This is because pitch is actually fairly easy to make. All you have to do is cook pine sap, and Lewis assumes that pines are gonna be available pretty much anywhere in the country. Well, we have pine trees in this part of Montana, but they're up in the mountains, not down here on the water. <laughs> uh, Lewis literally has his people collecting driftwood in hopes that some of it might be pine. But in the end, he is forced to go to an alternative. The same compound he's using to, protect, to, make the, to clear the cracks on the wooden vessels here, a thick, tarry paste made from buffalo tallow, beeswax, and finely ground charcoal. 
I've worked with the stuff, it's nasty, but it did work at least on the wooden hull boats. Well, the portage is completed about the same time that Lewis is putting the finishing touches on the iron frame boat. This all happens around July 4th. The men celebrate Independence Day by drinking the last of their whiskey supply, and a couple of days later they attempt to launch the iron frame boat. Now, Lewis notes in his journals with satisfaction that it is easily carried by six men, something you can't say of these dugouts, and he said once launched she swam like a perfect cork. Now they begin loading up and preparing to go when a wind comes up, blows the water up, slops over the side of the iron frame boat. They have to take everything out to dry it and when they've got everything ready to go again, Lewis notes with some disgust that the boat isn't working, that the uh, waterproofing material that works fine on a rigid hull doesn't work so well on a leather hull. It had cracked, it had peeled, it had come away, the seams open and as Lewis said, the boat leaks that she would not answer. Without pitch, the damage, the evil was irreparable. Lewis added, I need not add that this event mortified me not a little. Fortunately, Clark's hunting parties further upstream had found a good-sized cottonwood grove. They were able to build a couple of additional canoes, but that took two more weeks. Lewis and Clark came here expecting to spend three or four days getting around the Great Falls. They wind up spending 34 days here. And then as they head upstream, they run into the same issue, trying to get to the headwaters of the Missouri because they assume that's how they get across the country. They get there and then find the additional streams that go into the mountains that take you through hundreds of miles of wilderness before you finally find the river that takes you to the river that gets you to the Columbia. <laughs> so Lewis and Clark had hoped to reach the Pacific and return to Fort Mandan by the end of 1805 and they barely reached the Pacific coast at the end of November. And as they contemplate the return trip over that winter at Fort Clatsop, they begin to realize some places they should have maybe listened a bit more to the natives. The Nez Perce people had asked them in the fall of 1805, well, how did you get here? Well, by this route. So how long was that? 59 days from Great Falls to the Traveler's Rest? We have a path through the mountains. We call it the Road to Buffalo. Five days from Traveler's Rest to Great Falls. So when the expedition gets back to Traveler's Rest in July 4, 1806, they split up. Lewis takes a small band across the road to Buffalo. We know it today as Lewis and Clark Pass. They get back to Great Falls in eight days, partly because a party unknown steals a lot of their ponies along the way. Clark takes the other party along the route they used the previous year because of the pickup equipment they left behind. But traveling with the current is much easier. When they get to the Three Forks, the party splits. A portion of them continue down the Missouri to bring the canoes back to the portage at Great Falls. L uh, Clark takes the other men across country over Bozeman Pass to explore the uh, lower reaches of the Yellowstone River and hopefully make contact with the crow. So what you wind up with here at Great Falls is uh, 12 men led by Sergeant Ordway and Sergeant Gass who were in charge of the portaging party. Uh, they're using the same carts, they're moving most of the same canoes. Three of the biggest ones are badly damaged and can't be portaged. The main difference in 1806 is that it's a lot wetter, it rains more often, and they do have some problem with the carts bogging. Uh, the other difference, though, is that in 1806 they have four horses to replace a lot of the manpower. And with that addition to their force, the expedition members are able to complete the return portage in only nine days without much trouble. You won't hear about it much from Lewis or Clark, though, because the captains aren't here. Lewis is on the, uh, the Marias River, getting into a fatal encounter with the Blackfeet at Two Medicine Creek. Clark is on the Yellowstone, getting his pony herd stolen by the crow. The sergeants are in charge here. And that's how it works for military organizations. You don't need officers in charge of routine operations. And that's what the portage had become by this point. So Ordway's party completes the portage. They get the white pirogue out of storage. It's in good condition. They add that to the little flotilla and head up to the mouth of the Marias, where Lewis had ordered them to wait, if necessary, until the 1st of September, until he completed his uh, surveys of the Marias River. Well, Lewis's survey got cut short by the encounter with the Blackfeet, so here come his people on stolen Indian ponies, riding as if the whole uh, nation of the Blackfeet is about to come and take their revenge. So let's get rid of the horses, let's get out of here. 
but he does stop long enough to check out the cached red pirogue, which it turns out has rotted out. Even though he's concerned about all this, <laughs> he does stay long enough for the men to remove every usable piece of metal from the hulk of the red pirogue. Which leads to an interesting point. Meriwether Lewis, uh, when his men get back to the Great Falls, one of the first things they do is open up these cache pits where they've stored supplies they didn't have room for in the canoes. Uh, the pits themselves had been inundated in the spring floods, so the expedition had lost a lot of gear. But Lewis noted that the frame for the iron boat was not materially affected for having been buried. And he says nothing more about it. Which has led some people to believe that uh, maybe Lewis left it here. They've gone out, they've tried to find it. But count me as one who thinks they never will. <clears throat> My feeling is anybody who is so hard up for metal that he's going to strip rusty nails out of a rotten boat isn't going to leave 200 pounds of top quality hand wrought iron sitting in the hole in the ground just because it didn't work as a boat frame. Uh, and we know that Toussaint Charbonneau was paid for his efforts as an interpreter for the expedition by being given the blacksmithing equipment, which really wouldn't have been worth much without the extra metal stock. So I'm assuming that's what happened to the frame of the iron boat, but I can't prove it. It's not in the journals. The difference between the 1805 and 1806 portages, though, was really the difference between night and day. Lewis and Clark and their men made a lot of mistakes in 1805, but they were able, because of that, to plan more realistically for the problems they would face in 1806, and were able to carry off the uh, return portage as a routine operation. So I guess from our little tale of two portages, we come to one rather important point. Sometimes the old cliches are true, most notably that one about knowledge is power. Well, thank you folks for coming and listening to me today, and I hope you can come out and see us here at the Interpretive Center sometime soon. Thank you.